Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for logging on to the fourth session of a week-long series entitled The Black Ladder Series in celebration of Black History Month, hosted by the South Westminster Goods and curated by Pop-Up Africa. I'm Jessica Ladderton, founder of Pop-Up Africa, and this afternoon I'll be in conversation with the fabulous Priscilla Baffour, Head of Global Diversity and Inclusion for the Financial Times. We'll be speaking about gender and race in the corporate world. And um, Priscilla is personally a big inspiration to me, so I'm sure that you'll walk away from this webinar highly inspired. Priscilla, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jessica. The first Thank you very much for having us. So the first question I wanted to ask you, Priscilla, is tell us a bit about your career journey from studies to present day. Did you always aspire to work in in diversity and inclusion or how did it all come about? Really good, really good question Jess and thank you so much for having me today. It's an absolute pleasure to be here as part of your Black History Month celebrations. Um, so yeah, I, I've always had a passion for media if I'm honest. So my journey into inclusion and diversity started I would say with my, my love for media, my curiosity to, to tell stories, to tell those un, untold stories um, from people that come from an underrepresented group. Um, I, when I was younger, I used to go to, to Ghana quite a bit um, in the summer holidays, you know, on a family holiday. And it became really clear to me that there was a huge difference. Obviously back in Ghana, you'd put on the TV and it was very represented. Um, at times maybe more men um, than women, but there was still that obviously that racial, and ethnically diverse representation. And then I'd come back to the UK and it was so different. And I really felt that difference. And I felt that our, our stories weren't being told. So um, from a young age, like I said, always passionate about getting into media. And I remember when I was picking universities to go to, saying to my dad, right, dad, I'm going to study um, broadcast journalism. No, 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 I said, I'm going to study media. That was it. And he said, oh, media. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Media law. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do media, like broadcast journalism. And to, he was very annoyed about that, um, coming from a family of, of academics that were kind of lawyers and, you know, worked in, in science and the medical side of things. But I think that really came from a fear of, you know, the creative industries not being that stable. And I think a fear that, you know, there was that lack of representation in our industry. So to my dad's annoyance, you know, I went off to university, I studied a, a degree in broadcast journalism and, you know, worked really hard. You know, because my, I remember my mum saying to me, because I think my dad probably stopped talking to me for a while, actually, for a few months. And I remember my mum saying to me, you know, if you're going to do this, I will fully support you. But you can't be mediocre. You're going to have to work really hard and you're going to have to go above and beyond. And so that kind of work ethic was instilled in me from, from university. So like I said, I was in the student radio. Um, working for the for the university newspaper, I did lots of work experience. Even at sixteen, I was in work experience with the BBC. Um, and then I think when I came out of university, it's then when I started to see those barriers. So, um, you know, everybody was applying for jobs, and I could, I remember just applying for job after job, and like just no doors were being opened. And there were three barriers that I kind of identified coming out of university. Um, and, you know, a lot of people that have done some research into social mobility and in the creative industries have identified with somebody. So one of them is the financial barrier. So I came out and at that time it was, you know, you had to volunteer, you know, unpaid work experience, that prevalence of unpaid work experience. And I'll be honest with you, Jess, with a dad that was like, didn't want me to get into this industry. He wasn't about to look after me. I couldn't live off the bank of mom and dad. <laughs> that was a huge barrier. And then I, the network. So I didn't know anybody that worked in this industry. And I'd started, you know, my work experience early, um, going to mm. university um, and building up those connections, those work experience connections, but they weren't all there. And the third barrier, that information piece, because when I was in university, it wasn't clear about what you needed to do to go into a specific role. Um, and yeah. so when, again, I guess my, my passion for inclusion and diversity developed. So I went on to work for Media Trust. Um, I did some roles actually in events and PR for a while, so some comms roles. Um, and then I went on to, um, to lead project manage some youth mentoring initiatives at the Media Trust, uh, where we were using media really as a tool for engagement and working on mentoring programs. Um, and then I started to see that there were a number of these youth 
organizations that were doing fantastic work but what a lot of these young people wanted from disadvantaged backgrounds was to get a job you know to get in and get on and so after having to um, after having my first child actually my my daughter I went on to work at Channel 4 where I spearheaded Full Talent and over at Full Talent I won the Deputy Prime Minister's Award uh, for playing a pioneering role in tackling social mobility um, and I was also Amazing. Well, yeah, just, you know, you know, I think, again, when I was doing that stuff at, at um, Channel 4, diversity and inclusion wasn't even really a thing. It was more like CSR. And so I'd say that right. probably ahead of the game at that time. That was the only organisation mm -hmm. that was really supporting young people from various walks of life to come into the industry. And so mm -hmm. I was part of the team that set up the 360 Diversity Charter. Um, and, and you know, that, that, was a, that was amazing. But what I started to see was that we'd seen a lot of growth at entry level. So there were a lot of work experience placements, apprenticeships, you know, grad schemes, we were working on the production training scheme, but that talent was starting to hit a glass ceiling. And, right. you know, and so again, my passion grew even more and I really wanted to tackle diversity at that mid mid-level so after five years I left channel four um, and I was like right I'm gonna set up my own business I'm gonna take a risk I'm gonna set up my own diversity inclusion consultancy um, and again bringing in the parents my mum was like oh what about your pension <laughs> <laughs> what's wrong with you <laughs> you've got a good job <laughs> you've got a good job you've got security you know why why do you want to mess this up but it was something I needed to do I knew that you know, it would mean that I could work with various global companies, but it was an opportunity for me to, to grow and develop. And as I said, build that global expertise. So, you know, there I was kind of delivering training, we did some great projects in Africa, facilitating sessions, you know, just securing talent really for the broadcasters and production companies, and then also mentoring and coaching a lot of talent. And then I, um, ITN reached out to me actually. That's how I went to ITN. Um, and I initially joined there as, as a consultant um, and ended up staying for 18 months there. So my role at ITN was really working with the CEO and the executive team to set transparent workforce uh, diversity targets. And I pioneered their work around the gender and ethnicity pay gap. So I think that's kind of me in a nutshell, a whistle stop tour. Um, and then after being at the ITN, I am now at um, Financial Times, where, as you said, I, I uh, lead a global team. Um, and my role is really to embed um, inclusion and diversity into the organisation. Amazing. Thank you so much, Priscilla. I can see that you've been very busy building your career. <laughs> and quite rightly so, through hard work, you've got to where you are now. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that, because I'm sure a lot of people listening um, that are at the beginning of their career will definitely be inspired into different ways and different avenues that they can go into, even leaving a secure, a secure job to start your own business, um, develop new skills. I think that's very um, inspirational in itself. So what I wanted to ask you is, you've jumped from a company like Channel 4 to the Financial Times. Um, what was, did you notice a difference in the environment and the, the work culture? What's it, what was the jump like going from entertainment media to financial media? That's a really good question and I often get asked that question um, quite a lot, Jess. So I think the culture is actually quite similar, um, to be honest, and that's probably the reason why the transition was a bit easier for me. Um, if you look at some of the, the broadcasters and the media companies that I've worked for, so like ITV, Channel 4, you know, ITN and various companies through Media Trust, you can see that the structures there can be quite flat um, and there's not actually much churn at the top. So you start to see that people stay in jobs for a very long time and they just don't leave. So it becomes very difficult then to, to bring in any change. Um, and it's also difficult then for talent from underrepresented groups to progress. So that side of things was definitely very similar in terms of that systemic culture. I would say yeah. he's probably more flexible um, than some of the companies I've worked for. There's less presenteeism. And when I joined, I guess one of the, the plugs for me was the fact that, you know, I did have that option to work wherever I wanted to. And I guess that's probably why it was really easy for us to get everybody um, working remotely from home because we've been doing it for quite a while already. But would it be useful for me to just share a bit of context yeah. as well? 
Um, cause yeah, yeah, that would be really good. Yeah, because a lot of people don't know much about the OFT. They often think of the, the pink paper. But um, yes. we provide a broad range of information, so news and services for the global business community. And our readers actually access content through a number of various different platforms. I think at the FT, we're very fortunate that we have that powerful external voice. You know, we're recognised for our journalistic integrity, that curiosity and trust. But we're old. We're like 130 years old. Um, and so with that history and that legacy comes both, you know, challenges and opportunities. And because, you know, when people think about the FT, there's a perception that we're all white, o Oxbridge educated, yes. middle-class men walking around in pin pinstripes suits and bowler. Yeah. Um, That's definitely the view I had. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people do, a lot of people do. <laughs> they do, uh, but it's, do you know what, it's not the reality today. And we've, we've worked really hard and we continue to work really hard to shift that perception of the FT. That's a big part of my role. Yeah. Um, really do that by diversifying the workforce um, and our readership so that's good and but the market has changed so much and so we, when we talk mm. the media companies we're all there are many competitors as you know just in our market so we've got yeah now there's vice business insider you know the rise of mobile um the facebook's the next mm. world it all changes how yeah. we consume use and what that means in terms of our products and services that we deliver and you know, all of these changes do do impact our business commercially as well in terms of how we distribute our mm. content to our readers, how content's paid for, but also how we build and engage a more diverse audience and readership. Um, so from a people yeah. constantly looking for new skills, we constantly have to think about you know different ways of working. Um, but also we need to make sure that our, our culture continues to evolve. Yeah, definitely. And just on that as well, just in terms of evolving and changing and having to stay on top of your game um, and the effects of the internet and co online competitors. Now, your role is global head of yeah. um, inclusion and diversity. So that means that you work not just in the UK, but um, I imagine that you work across the globe as well. So yeah. when we were speaking on Monday with the three business owners, we were talking about um, a statement that was made around the black British experience being somewhat easier than the mm. black American experience. Mm. So being the global head of inclusion and diversity, I wanted to see what, what you found through working with other, other countries. Have you found that the culture in America, for example, um, was more accommodating to the development of black people or um, is it pretty much yeah. the same? Okay. Good question. I think that, you know, the, the, the systemic challenges are definitely the same. Um, mm. But I think that in the UK, we've been much more subtle about it. Um, so much more subtle about systemic racism. Whereas in the UK, they're much more, it's, you know, it's part of the dinner table conversation, right? They're much more open about it, which is good. Um, I think if you think about it on an international scale, I, I also look after to Asia. Um, and okay. so... Those, those cultural differences in work definitely play out differently in, in China and Japan, where you have more mm. groups. Um, so if I just use um, kind of Black Lives Matter and the events that followed the George Floyd killing, you know, our, our colleagues in Asia were a bit like, well, why are we talking about this? Because mm. when, when the protests happened in China, for example, no, yeah. Yeah. no, one, no one was, no, our CEO wasn't sending out an email about that so what, <laughs> Interesting. and you know for me it was well you work for a global company right and this is a global issue um and so it's, it's we always have to bring it back to that global piece i think manila mm. an area um that i look after and over there you know when we were all working remotely and quite excited that we had that privilege of working from home it was a challenge for yeah. them they don't have the infrastructure they don't have the wi-fi at home mm. even, to even do that. So it's important to have a global kind of overarching DNI strategy with clear yeah. objectives, then you have to localize it. Okay. It needs to be mm. every every culture. So it's good to have a central mission, but you do have to be really respectful as well to those cultural norms because they are yes, exactly. even though we may not like some of them and they don't make sense mm. to them, are there. And so you do have to respect them. So at times it can be challenging. So you know, there yeah. are parts of the world, even in Europe, where we can't collect certain diversity data um, because right. there's legal restrictions. And so that, that can be a barrier sometimes. 
Okay, thank you. And that's really interesting how the culture differs from country to country, especially what you're saying about China. Yeah. Um, the CEO not addressing society issues that are happening that are topical. Um, yeah. So yeah, it goes to show that you know you have to be respectful of the different cultures and the way things are being done across the globe. Yeah. Um, so yeah. on on culture on culture coming back to the UK now, it said that within the UK there's this culture of going out after work um, and socialising and a lot of opportunities happening whilst socialising, like you learn about uh, new roles that might be coming up, you might connect with one of your colleagues, which kind of opens doors for you. How have you, do you, do you think that's true? To what extent do you think that statement is true? Yes, I do think it's true actually, Jess. And you know, you've, you've worked in the media for a while, you've worked in this industry, and, and it is a lot of kind of early mornings and late nights, and in a global role like my own, that means a lot of travel. Um, but that, that statement's definitely there. And I find that often women from black, Asian, minority, ethnic backgrounds really struggle with that aspect, you know? Mm. Because some of us just want to get home after work. We don't want to go to the pub, you know? Yeah. The pub, yeah. some people that I've been in, in contact with through my role, you know, their first introduction to the pub was in their first, you know, working role. And so the creative industries is very much based on, you know, who you know, um, yeah. in and those connections. And as difficult it, as this is for me to say, in order for mm. you to get on in this industry, networking is, is just is key. And that's why I'm a big believer of sponsorship yeah. programs, you know, because yeah. it is that, that senior person, at times that white middle class man, that is saying, you need to hire this person, you need to promote this person, yeah. it's amazing. Or it is that kind of, that person from a dominant group that's saying, actually you come along with me to that networking event. Um, and, mm. and, you get to hear about you know all those things that's going on those promotions all the strategic stuff so you know it's an issue for us it, i think for us as black women because it we we want the credit for hard work we remember we're told from a young age mm. i was told yeah you have to go above and beyond right you have to work hard so then when you get into a job and you've got your head down you know you're working hard <laughs> no managers coming along to tap you on the shoulder to offer you a yeah. struggle you know the data tells us that we struggle to even ask for pay rises you know and mm. that's the cultural influence you know because it's you know I'll wait until I'm asked will I look disrespect will I look like I'm I'm not I'm only interested in the money um, and I think it's okay to demand what's rightfully ours you know and so I think mm. it's an issue um, but we do have a lot of work to do. I think we have to be aware of our blind spots. And at times, I know it feels uncomfortable networking. It feels a bit awkward, but they are the yeah. thing to the next level. And how's it been as a working mum as well? Because obviously going out to socials, you might not have as much flexibility as some of your colleagues would. Have you, uh, have you come across any? <laughs> yeah, it's tough. And I'll be really honest with you. I think this year things have changed. We're against mm. the backdrop of a pandemic and, you know, yeah. us are able to work from home more. You know, tech has been quite a leveller and I feel mm. I'm guilt because I'm here all the time, right? But, and I, I think I have more of a work-life blend. It's definitely not balanced <laughs> at all. Yeah. <laughs> a blend of, yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, do the school run, you come back and then you're at home, so you, then you put a wash on and then yeah. thinking, right, I'm going to do some work and then I'm going to put dinner on. And so I definitely find that even though there is more of a blend, it's, I have less time for myself. Um, but mm. I feel present much more because, you know, whereas tonight, for example, if I've got to take my son to football, I can do that yeah. and log on and, be at, and still be at this In a way, this is yeah, yeah, yeah. easier. Oh, that's brilliant. That's good. And have you come across any, like, I don't know, some judgment from colleagues when you've had to like nip off and do things of your colleagues being quite understanding how how does fi the financial times support working mums in particular yeah very supportive at the at, um at the financial times around flexible working and i think for the first time in my career in this role i was able to leave loudly mm. i don't know if you've ever experienced this. Okay. At other companies where i've worked if i know that okay right on a wednesday for example i need to leave early to pick up the kids and do the school run I would like hover around like quietly try and put the things in my bag I wouldn't want to get no yeah, yeah. 
um, and then, but now, like at EFT, I, it's different. It's like, all oh, right, cool, I'm leaving. Yes, I was here at eight o'clock. I'm probably going to log on, tonight, but I could leave loudly. I think it's definitely different. Um, and I think we also um, did our flexible working policy so that it was for everyone. Okay. Because yeah, there's often dads that were thinking, I want to leave, but there's that notion that it's always the woman that has to leave. Um, yeah, yeah, so for everyone, not just working mums. Yeah, that's so yeah. true. Okay, thank you. Um, so, a recent article stated that more than a third of board members across the FTSE 100, out mm. of them, 350 are women. So, meaning that corporations had met their gender diversity targets. Um, but looking more closely at these and who the women actually were, there was an alarming lack of um, alarming lack of black and ethnically diverse women being represented. So I know that you've got you probably have a lot to say on this. Um, yes. What are your views? <laughs> what are your views on this? And do you think it's fair to lump all women together when policies are being put in place, or is it important for diversity data to be broken down? Yeah, very, very good question, Jess, and something that, you know, I've been focused on quite a, a bit in, in my role at the FT. And mm. I think many organisations have, have focused on gender because, because of the gender pay gap, but also um, it's easier, actually, to, to work across mm. gender. Most people, you know, know a woman, a mum, an auntie, a sister. So it's, it's much more easier to relate to than other um, diversity dimensions. But, you know, we've not made enough progress in race and ethnicity. Um, and it's easy sometimes for organisations just to focus on one thing and do one strand at a time. But it's really mm. important that we look at the data. Data is essential to this conversation, but it's important that we look at that data with an intersectional lens. Um, and from many reports that we've read, and actually from, from my experience working with a number of organisations, I often ask, where are black women in this conversation? And who's focused yeah. on this? And I would say really, for some organisations, they've only really started to focus um, on this in the last year or so. Um, but mm. we, we lumped into one group. And, you know, when I've looked at gender identity in the, in the past, I think it's clear that, you know, black women, they're not represented. You know, I've often mm. felt that when, you know, I've attended events, I've been the only person there. Um, I've been the only person in the boardroom. Um, and that's, yeah. tough, especially for, you know, Younger talent that's coming up in the industry is really key that we have role models there as well um, to, look mm. at, to aspire to. And I, just to bring in my you know, experiences of the FT, when I joined, it was great to see that there was lots of work that had been done to progress you know, women into senior roles. And it was making a huge difference. You know, more women were yeah. taking senior leadership positions across the organisation. You know, our senior management group had reached 48%. You know, we'd set a goal to hit gender parity by 2022. So we were tracking really well, seeing women at leadership. Yeah. But when I came in, started to look at the data, that wasn't intersectional and it didn't speak to the, to the black female experience. But mm. what I felt at the FT was that there was a strong appetite from the business to broaden our diversity goals and prioritise race and ethnicity. But before we could do that, we needed to get more data. And many organisations don't even have the data. Um, but, you know, at the FT, we made it a goal. Um, we knew that the data would help us to define, you know, further milestones. For example, we knew we wanted to be transparent and publish our ethnicity pay gap. But we couldn't do that. Mm. We didn't have enough data. So that's been a huge focus for us. When I joined the organisation, only 50, less than 56% of the company had disclosed their ethnicity data. Uh, mm. That's now 84%. Um, so it just means that we have a better idea of where we need to focus our efforts. Um, and that's, I mean, we all know the data is important, right? But the real yeah. case is human. And I think it's really um, important that we understand the lived experience. So we've, we're seeing that a lot more this year, I think. Um, there are a lot more spaces where people feel like they can come and talk about what it's like for them as black women. But, you mm. know, can work and feel like I belong, you know, can I bring my own food? without fear of someone like turning up their nose um, <laughs> of the microwave. Can I change my hair when I want to, mm. you know, being judged? You know, can I be assertive even? Oh, you know, I, I work with senior leadership and the CEO, but at times I think, can I be assertive and hold someone to account without yeah. being a black woman? Mm. So I love data because the data doesn't lie. 
and what gets measured will always, always get done. Um, so it's important, yeah. that, but it's important that we track that data across the whole employee life cycle, you know, to, to really mm. where the issues are. Yeah, 100% agree on that one. Um, and you touched on something really briefly that's, that's really key. You spoke about representation um, and the fact that representation is really important. And for you, you've been in the boardroom where you've been the only black woman. Um, so from your perspective, why? I mean, I know why, but <laughs> from your own mouth, why is representation so important? And what, and what does it do um, for an organisation? Yeah, Jess, it's so, it's so important. I mean, we know, you know this, and we know from many reports that embracing diversity is not only the right thing to do, but it's just good business. And I don't know if you've seen, but McKinsey, they mm. report um, on a regular basis, and their recent diversity wins report shows the business case for diversity and inclusion is stronger than ever before. So their research found that companies with high levels of ethnic and cultural diversity were 36% more likely to outperform their competitors, right? And this is slightly up in mm. 2017. So it's tracking upwards year on year. 2017, it was 33%. This year, it's 36%. So the research continues to show us that diverse organisations that attract and develop individuals from the widest pool of talent consistently perform better. You know, it's a, a non-brainer. You know, we know yeah. that feel included you get better engagement better performance and better innovation yeah so for me it's you know we I, i'm at that point now where i actually start i'm starting to stop talking about the business case because mm. you know the data the data saying it all mm. and what does that what does effective diversity and inclusion look like what are you what have you implemented so far at the financial times what have you found because i know obviously it might look a certain way one year and like you said things are constantly evolving what does yeah. it look like at the minute really good question jess and so one thing i always say is that there's no silver bullet to this stuff and there's not a one-size-fits-all and you find that many you can, some hr professionals many dni professionals think that you can just copy and paste initiatives and that yeah. the organization's unique and this is why the data is important because the mm. data then ensures that you focus on those areas that need the most attention so since i joined the ft that's what i did i did a review i put my recommendations to the board and the recommendations were clear that you know there was a glaring lack of racial and ethnic diversity within the company but then yeah. we were tracking well so the role there was really to just maintain but in terms of 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 uh, race and ethnicity they needed to be a huge focus so firstly as i said it was you know ensuring that i ran a campaign to to ensure mm. that data um uh disclosures were going higher and people were self identifying um and then what i've done is i although i have a global strategy we set business area goals and track progress with leaders on a quarterly basis yeah. so for one area let's say for editorial it may be that they need to focus on um race ethnicity maybe social mobility right but for for our other teams like tech you know b2b they probably have got great representation around race but really need to do some work around disability mm. so that's this is why it's really important to have that um those business area action plans and track on a quarterly basis so there's been that which has been really successful we've also seen that there's that invisible barrier at times between leadership um, and, you know, high performers, high achievers from underrepresented groups. So we've set up a reverse mentoring program um, and that's also linked to a next generation board. So where yeah. we, we don't have that diversity on the board, but we want that diversity of thought, those fresh ideas, this next yeah. generation do a fantastic job at, um, at kind of injecting those fresh ideas. Um, employee networks is a huge part of my role. Mm. Um, so managing the employee networks, working with them on their strategies, helping them to um, prioritise, but also, also, you know, this year, really think about how we continue to build that culture of belonging and inclusion yeah. when working in a socially distanced world. It's so hard. Yeah. It's really, 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 really hard. So, I can um, imagine. Yeah, it is. And I think it's easier in some ways. So we ran an event in the summer. So following the events of George Floyd, we really decided to accelerate our efforts around race. And luckily, okay. we have a roadmap. But I think, you know, like I said, that glaring reality has made us move really quickly. So I implemented a diversity inclusion task force um, and I co-chair that with the CEO every month. And it's just a great way to ensure that this stays a priority. 
Um, and so out of that, we decided to bring in some, some external speakers to really talk quite candidly about race. And we've ran some Let's Talk About Race sessions that have just been a great safe space for people to ask those really awkward questions because race is still very awkward. Mm. And for the FT yeah. far, I mean, some of the titles that were going out for these events, I'm like, oh my God, this is so not FT. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know the titles, Priscilla. Tell us the titles. Um, so one of them was like how to, it was how to um, it was about it was about white allyship. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna remember the title for you by the end of this. But it was about um, speaking up um, to our white colleagues about the black experience. Okay, and, okay. What our white colleagues can do to support the black experience. Yes. So, sorry, we've never spoken that way. This black and white. Yeah. Way. You know, and so yeah, that, yeah. You know, there's a few conversations with comms around that. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, but you've got to bring everyone on the journey. So lots of stuff yeah. happening in the FT. Um, really starting to look at partnerships as well. Um, mm. A huge part of what, what we do, uh, um, to, from a commercial point of view, we want to make sure that our brands are also representative. So it's, mm. it's, it's a real kind of business area focus for us. And so one day it could be someone feeding back on coverage you know, and saying, you know, could, could this be done in a different way? Is this really speaking yeah. to the audience? And then the next yeah. thing, it could be um, doing stuff around recruitment and reviewing the recruitment processes. Amazing. Um, and I just wanted to remind the viewers as well, if you do have any questions for Priscilla, please do drop them into the chat box um, or into the question and answer box. And I will put them to Priscilla within the last 10 minutes of our talk. Um, but I still have some questions for you, so don't uh, go <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> so I want to go back to talking. <laughs> I want to go back to talking about these network groups because I'm really interested in those. Um, I wonder how much power they actually have within an organisation because I think it's fantastic that you know the reality is that not everybody is the same and not everybody will. Um, be able to relate to each other in, in the workplace and sometimes that's the beauty of it but it's yeah. also good that there are these groups that you can go to um, and sound off with and kind of share and relate to shared experiences that you go through whether it's being a woman whether it's being black whether it's being LGBT um, but how much influence do these network groups actually have? Have you had any experiences where they've put forward a suggestion and you've actually taken them on board? Yes, most definitely. I mean, this year at the FT, you know, more so than ever before, our employee networks have been instrumental um, in, you know, helping me to drive this strategy. Um, and I'll just use an example, you know, from uh, the events that followed um george floyd mm. um you know if it wasn't for our networks we couldn't we probably would have made progress in some areas and they were the first to really step up and really share their experiences in in a respectful way mm. but not only did they they share their experiences but they came along with recommendations now i think in the past i've seen employee networks that can be a bit of a moaning shop <laughs> and I think it's really difficult because we we know what the problems are we all know what the problem mm. What we care about now is how we move away from this kind of anger, this hurt, mm. this set yes. to action, you know, and solutions. And so, you know, our FT Embrace, our uh, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic employee group have really made me proud this year because they've been led by, you know, their members and what they want. They've looked at the data again um, and they've, they've asked for things. And I think sometimes employee network groups that don't feel empowered don't always ask for the right things um, that's so true in that space i think at the ft i think the board definitely respected uh, their views during um what followed george floyd and where there has been a disconnect i think that that um, our networks have helped to filter that one thing i would say though is that in many organizations they don't even give employee networks a budget and so I think it's super, super important that you give them a budget, empower them, you know, really do that strategic work with them, you know, so put a framework in place, um, a strategy, you know, ask them, I do every year, I do a strategic planning session with my, my co-chairs and say, you know, what is the focus for this year? What are your priorities? What does good look like? What do you want to achieve this, this year? Um, and give them the funds to be able to do that. Because this stuff costs money. If you really want to move the dial on this stuff, <laughs> yeah. it costs money. Um, money. <laughs> it does. It costs a lot of money. 
And so, um, so I think that's one thing. And I think what we also realized this year is that our employee networks are exhausted. They're so yeah. exhausted. And everybody wanted to speak to them like, oh, how do I ask this question mm. what do I do with my team? And it got to the point where I was like, they can't be the aunt that your go-to place all the time because they have a day job. You 100%, know, yeah. And I especially. So what we've done is ring fence some um, time off for them. So they have about six days off a month, about 10% of their role where they can take the time out just to focus on employee network activity. And then we're going to ensure that the work that they do is reflected in their, you know, performance development plans because it's leading, they're leading, they're leading a group. Yeah. It's, they're leading a group with mixed views. There's a lot of yeah. conflict at times. And I'll be honest with you, Jess, at times you have to manage expectations because, mm. you know, we can't do it all, especially for organizations that don't have a budget. You can't do it all, but that's why the data is important, I think, because it can help, help you to prioritize. A hundred percent. And I think these networks are a really important resource for the organizations itself. So yeah. sometimes I think we look at the networks and think it's helping the employees, but really and truly, I think it's actually helping the company. Would you agree? Uh, completely. And I think, um, you know, a lot of companies are now starting to call these, you know, business um, resource groups because they help the business. Like I said, we would not have the kind of insight that they bring, but day to day leadership don't, don't see and hear those things. So they really are helping to shape the, the culture. And I think even for things like events as well, where they lead on that area of work, you know, it's helping create that culture of inclusion, right? For more people to join the organization. So I think definitely um, they have such a huge role to play. I think that they need to be empowered where they're not and also be, yeah be credited for what they've done and you know it's this should be you should look at the role of an e erg leader you know a network leader as as part of their career development plans is so important because yeah. you know, day to day role they may not be looking at budgets they may not be leading anyone but they're doing that every day in an employee network capacity yeah yeah looked at when we're thinking about promoting people in the organization as well a hundred percent and also yeah. so beyond the networks um, I've seen incidences where organisations put on training for employees. Mm. So like diversity and inclusion training. What are your views on that? Does, does training work? Good question, Jess. Um, so I've actually just rolled out some inclusive leadership training for um, our management board and senior leaders and made it mandatory for, in, for managers. And this is because when you usually put on training and you leave it voluntary, it's like preaching to the choir. The same people that want that change will go and the ones that need to attend won't go. And I know people have mixed views on this, um, but I think training is good, but training on its own is not enough. And mm. I've seen some companies say, oh, we've rolled out unconscious bias training. Oh, well, that's great. You've highlighted to people that we've all got a bias, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> what are you about that bias? How are you tackling that bias? So I think it's good to have that training, but it's even more important that you check in and make sure that there's a behavioral change. Because that, yeah. some just do it as a bit of a tick box and you just, it's behaviors. And so you have to constantly check in, but training on its own is not enough. But, but accountability yeah. is key. It really yeah. is. Yeah. Definitely. And how do we, how do we hold companies or leadership um, accountable within teams or within a, a whole organization? Really, really, really good question, Jess. And I mean, if without accountability, everything falls down, like honestly, it really, mm. transparency and account accountability is that first step to um, building an inclusive culture, right? And I yeah. think for systemic change to really happen at every level of the company, people need to be made accountable, especially managers, because I find that often leaders really get it. they like, yep, we get it. They're speaking at the town hall, you know, you mm. change on a quarterly basis they've set that set their personal goals but the problem is is how you activate those goals with managers and how you yeah. sit on a day-to-day -day basis um because that's where the problems happen right it's day-to-day -day. and so i think what you have to do is continuously track progress um, i think it needs to be reflected in um, everyone's personal development plans i think where you can have a diversity and inclusion council or a task force you know, so that you know that those priorities are always on the table. And then I would say where you can, and I've done this in the past and it's actually been quite powerful, you attach those personal diversity and inclusion goals to compensation. 
you know. Um, That's because, a good one. <laughs> yeah, you hit them where it hurts because some people, they won't be yeah. moved by the business case. They won't be moved by that this is the right thing to do. But if you start to hit their money, you start to mess with yeah. them, they're going to be moved. <laughs> Yeah, so, I've seen that happen and that's been quite powerful. And also, if you, if leaders know what matters to your boss matters to you. So if you know yeah. every quarter, there's a meeting in the diary with me, the CEO and your boss, you're going to make sure that you've got something to say. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that definitely helps. I would say publishing data externally um, is, will also, you know, hold companies to account. So we publish our ethnicity pay gap and we've committed to accelerate um, the kind of efforts of ethnic minority employees to ensure that they're represented at every level of the organization but also we've committed to support career progression now when mm. we publish our annual diversity inclusion report and we haven't made any progress you know not only will our employees um, hold us to account but external um, uh, kind of prospective employees will do that as well and I'm not sure if you've seen but there's um, there's quite a lot of research recently that shows that job seekers like now mm. turn on roles or you know they decide right. not to do a job because of that perceived lack of inclusion at a company mm. a couple of weeks ago Glassdoor they yes. now launched a new function um, that gives current or former employees the opportunity to rate an organization on its diversity inclusion efforts which is oh, really interesting yeah. yeah because this is coming from this is not the company's kind of you know statement we want people from all works walks of life come to what come as you are Bring your, <laughs> these are people that have been at the organization of experience so i think this could be a real game changer um and yeah really interesting to see that data over the next uh next few months yeah we, we shall we shall keep a lookout <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> see how it progresses yeah, and Jess, I think also just to add here that the, the issue that I have with this is, you know, it's who, who does it affect when we don't meet these goals and these targets? Mm, it's yeah. the underrepresented groups that are affected time and time again. And so it's, yeah. it's too easy, I think, for leaders to say, oh, you know, progress has been slow. We haven't done much. And I think this is why sometimes you need that government legislation and almost that mm. humiliation. We need to shame companies into doing this right if they're not. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think you were right when you said hit them where it hurts and, you know, financially, if it affects them, I can, I can bet you, I can guarantee you a lot of companies will pull their socks up on this. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Yeah, they will. So I wanted to, I wanted to talk a bit more about your journey into where you are now, because you're obviously very successful in your, in your field. Um, but it's an issue if you're going into the boardroom and you're the only one. Um, mm. So it'd be interesting to know, number one, how you know how you got to where you are without seeing people like you around you. Did you have a mentor? Did you have, uh, you know, you might have had more than one mentor for different things. Yeah. Um, did you have people that you looked up to? Tell yeah. us a bit more about that. Good question, Jess. It's funny actually. I was thinking about this the other day because I was on a I was at a government um, event with one of my mentors which was really interesting we were both on this panel together and I was like wow like it was quite emotional because I felt that you know person had really inspired me when I was kicking off in the industry and that now I was around the table you know with them yeah um and that's so that's amazing yeah that was it was a real moment and so it got me thinking about you know what the journey has been like and I'll be really honest it's it is challenging. It hasn't been easy. It's been a lot of hard work, a lot of early mornings, a lot of late nights. And especially when kind of kids came into the mix, I think I really had to, mm -hmm. to flex and adapt a lot more. And that I think was, was quite hard. Um, mentoring for me, I wouldn't be where I am today without great men mentors and sponsors. It's the sponsorship aspect of mentoring that is just so powerful. And Tell us a bit more about the sponsorship um, aspect for people that don't really know much about it. Yeah, um, sure. So I think sponsorship is really that, it's that person that speaks up about you in the room okay. there. It's yeah. that person that introduces you to their network and says, you know, go and meet with Jackie about that, you know. Oh, or my friend James is really good at that. You should speak to him about that. It's that person that brings you into their network and their day-to-day. -day. And I think mm -hmm. that's where you see the real, that's where you have real impact because it's not just someone telling you what you should go and do, which is 
mentoring, which is great, but it's someone almost holding your hand to do it and, and speaking you up, bigging you up when you're not there. And we all do this. It's this halo and horn effect that a lot of people have. Like, if I say to you, if I go to a meeting, I'm like, you need to meet Jess. She's absolutely amazing. Like, she's yeah. brilliant. Like, I've worked with her for years. You would love her. You come to that meeting, like, this Jess is going to be amazing. Because <laughs> who you, you regard as quite high art or influential mm. has, you know, you big that person up. So you have respect. You rally what they say. So that's why sponsorship is powerful. But I'll be honest with you. Black women don't do it enough. And, you know, one of the things I've always said, or I've always done, and I always give this advice to younger talent coming up, is ask for help. Like, you know, ask, yeah. like, the worst thing someone's going to say is no. You know, and if you yeah. ask, mentor you or coach you and they say no, well, you don't want them mentoring you anyway. So you just move on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't tend to ask. And I think you need various different mentors. I have mentors you know, that are in my, my personal life that I'll go to for things around mm. family and running the home, you know, yeah. there's, there's my work professional mentors as well. And so I think, yeah. We all have them. Um, yeah, and they keep us grounded as well, I think. And they keep you in check as well. If you, if you speak out an ambition, you've already said it, so you've got to do it, especially yeah. if you've said it to your mentor, they'll be like, right, Silla, you said you yeah. wanted to be the CEO of Financial Times, where are you with this now? What are you doing? <laughs> I do this to people all the time and they get really hot and frustrated. They're like, oh, you really had time. I was like, yeah, I had time. Yeah. I have two kids to get ready in the morning and you're telling me that I have time and it's just yeah, yeah. It's, it's accountability, uh, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I think that, it's we have to invest in ourselves because I think sometimes yeah. we don't recognize that we also as an underrepresented group have certain blind spots and yeah. uh, you know why I, I, it's, I don't always allow people to use the race card yeah mm. sometimes I say actually well that's probably not a racing because I've seen you've not really been quite confident in this area you yeah. know have you asked that promotion have you asked for more money yeah you know a lot of the time we're waiting for managers to come and tap us on the shoulders and say, oh, now it's time. And that's, now it's never going to happen. There'll be someone out that's more hungrier than you that will yeah. go and ask. For it. it tends to be the white middle class man. Yeah. That's it. Why do you think that is? I think it's Why cultural. Do you, think? Yeah. you do. Because I struggled with this in the beginning. So I struggled with managing people that were older than me when I was younger because right. of that thing. So I came from an African household. Respect mm. your elders. And so for me to try and give someone older than me orders, even now, yeah. uh, one of the ladies in my team, she's in her, her mid fifties. And sometimes when I'm asking her to do things, I feel like, mm -hmm. quite, and I shouldn't, but yeah. it's, just, it's yeah. ingrained in me from when I was younger. Like, that I'm, how can I be sending her? She's going to get me a coffee. Like, yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And so I think that's a cultural thing. And I think that that can be difficult sometimes, bringing those mm. into the workplace. That can yeah. be Oh, yeah and do you think and do you think imposter syndrome plays a bit of a of a, a bit yeah. of a role in this as well in people's lack of confidence they feel like i shouldn't be here um, yeah look around you're the only one what am i doing here do i know what i'm talking about how has Gosh, imposter yeah. syndrome affected you if it, if it has at all yeah all it creeps up all the time and i remember mm -hmm. just before i started my ft role because of those perceptions that we were talking about of the ft i remember about yeah yeah a week before I started the role, imposter syndrome kicked in. And I was like, mm. no, like they're not, they're not like me. <laughs> <laughs> they don't look like me. They don't talk like me. They don't, they haven't been educated like I've been educated. And you almost then start talking yourself out. And then I was like, oh, I should have just stayed where I was. Like, why didn't I just stay? <laughs> why am I doing this to myself? Should have got my pension. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then I think... Uh, push through out of your comfort zone. I know it's hard. And I think this is where kind of trauma plays into this conversation a bit as well. I think mm. intersectionality between, you know, um, gender, race and ethnicity, but also from a mental health perspective, if you go yeah. into a boardroom or a situation where you don't see anyone that looks like you, or you feel that you can't be yourself, that's so traumatic. Imagine every day, coming to mm. performing like you know, yeah that is really difficult and so I think now I do definitely do less of that than what I did when I was younger I think I definitely did more of that when I was younger and now I think it just impacts your mental health too much my head I don't even have mm. the head to even do that anymore <laughs> and all of that I don't even have 
I don't have the headphones. <laughs> You've just got to get on with the work, isn't it? Yeah. Don't have time. Yeah, exactly. Question yourself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. that w w time is going. Um, we've only got like five minutes left, unfortunately. But I don't want to leave without us. I know it's gone really quickly, but I don't yeah. want us to leave without talking about the future. The future, and the future being the next generation. You know, you've got yeah. children, Priscilla let's think about what we're going to do so that the the experience is a lot easier for them so yeah. i just want to find out from you what do you think we can do as leaders within our fields or you personally what are you doing as a leader within your field um to ensure that you know the the young people coming up don't experience things like imposter syndrome yeah really good question jess and you know this is my driver if i'm really honest with you my driver for this this area of work is to really change the future of work for the next generation. There's no way, like, honestly, we cannot get to a point where our kids are the same age as us and where they're still having this conversation. You know, we saw our parents yeah. the conversation we're still having now. We just can't let that happen. And so I think we yeah. have to keep on speaking up and speaking out. And I think this is why mm. this is such a tipping point because we're not staying silent anymore. You're right. We're not, we're speaking out, you know, two years ago, someone would have said to me at one of my previous organizations, there's no racism in this company because it's mm. not, there's none, definitely none. And, you know, and this year, those same companies are going, actually, from what we're hearing, there is systemic racism within this organization. So it's yeah. how we become anti-racist now. And so mm. I, by speaking out, that's when change begins to happen. And I think we've been silent on this for, for way too long. And we've just accepted almost that, oh, that's just how it is. I think li kind of linking into the, um, the, the gender conversation as well, I think that following the events of this year, we'll see more diversity. I'm an optimistic person. And so yeah. I think it's a bit too early to see what the change has been this year. But I think we will start to see more change because people will demand it. And if they don't get it especially women i think they mm. because black female entrepreneurs are leading the way when it comes to starting businesses you know black women yeah. are the largest female minority group of business owners and i was looking at some research um it was in the summer um in the us um and it was i think it was a report called the state of women owned businesses report um and it looks okay. like i'm gonna go check that out yeah, check it out. It's a really interesting report because it shows that African American women are more than two um, own more than two million businesses, and right. you know that means that they're the leading female minority group of business owners. So you know, statistically, women of color are four point five times more likely to start a business than any other demographic. You know, mm. and so that's you know people won't stay around. You know, as black women, if we we can't get to the boardroom, we'll create our own boardrooms. But where I think we will need the support and where the future generation definitely, the younger generation need the support is the mentoring piece. Yeah. And, and even for businesses, you know, I was reading a piece that we did in the FT this week, you know, people from ethnically diverse audiences struggle with startup funding. It's mm. such is there. And so these are some of the systemic things that we need to tackle, I think, um, for the future generation, but more mentoring, I think the education system definitely has a huge role to play, a huge role, like on so many levels, you know, it's Black History yeah. Month. How many schools are teaching Black History Month in the mm. school they are? Is it the, the narrative of, you know, Black people were slaves or is it the narrative of here are Black, you know, role models in our community? You can be like them, you know, mm. I think we definitely need to see more, more role models. Yeah, 100%. I agree on that, especially on the Black History Month topic as well. Um, in my opinion, it shouldn't even be called Black History. It should just be history. And history. Just be embedded, embedded in the curriculum yeah. as, as every other history is being taught as well. Yeah. Um, so exactly. I think definitely there's a lot of systemic changes that need to be made. And yeah. hopefully as more and more people are having their voices heard through the emergence of things like social media, people are standing up for themselves, people are standing their ground, allies are joining. So yeah. I'm like you, I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful that for the next generation, things will be a lot better. Yeah, they will. And they're already better, I think, because there's people like us, like you said, there's more allies, there's more activists. 
Um, and, and you know what? This generation, that younger generation, they're not standing for it. I remember the Black Lives Matter protest and it was just so inspiring to watch all races, all ages yeah. come together, yeah. just be like, no, we're not going to stand for this. And, and that's amazing. Come. Yeah, and I think one of our speakers said earlier in the week as well that this isn't just a black white issue, this is a global issue because yeah. without diversity, it's affecting the economy and the economy exactly. affects everybody ultimately. Um, yeah. So I think it's really in everyone's best interest um, to yeah. see the changes and towards those changes happening. But Sina, right. unfortunately, that's, that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's been good to have a cup of tea and, and a chat with you, Jen. Yeah, <laughs> a lunchtime chat. And I hope all of our attendees have enjoyed it too. Before you go, do you mind just sharing where people can hear more about you, where people can follow you? Sure. Thanks, Jess. So I'm active on LinkedIn. So I'm Priscilla Baffle on LinkedIn. Um, and then on Twitter as well. So at Scylla for talent. So it's Scylla, C-I-L-L-A, and then the number four um, and talent. And so, yeah, I'm often on, on panels, speaking at conferences and things like that. And I'll always share any of the work that we're doing at the FT on those platforms. So yeah, mainly Twitter and LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scylla, and keep up the good work. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much, Jess. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>